we want to take some time now for questions from the audience. We've been collecting your questions as they've been submitted, and we'll try to answer as many as possible with the remaining time. So let's bring Kate back on the line. Thank you, Ginger. Um, we've had several questions submitted prior to the webinar that, that I believe the panelists have already addressed, and so we'll be sure to see if we can get through as many as possible here that are uh, not repeating the, the same points that have already been made. Uh, Ginger, in follow-up to some of the uh, discussion that you had about Oregon, we have a few uh, clarifying questions. Uh, one person wants to know, what is the correctional program checklist that you're using? And uh, another person also wants to know how those ratings are then derived. Um, who is evaluating the program? Is it the client officer or is it both? Okay. The, um, some of you may be familiar with the corrections program assessment inventory to the CPAI that was de developed um, by Ed Latessa and his group at the University of Cincinnati. Um, the Corrections Program Checklist is the next iteration of that tool. So it is a standardized program uh, assessment tool that was specifically designed to figure out if a program is designed and delivered consistent with the research on reducing recidivism. So there, there, it's a pretty structured process. We send out teams to do those reviews. Um, have been trained in that process. So um, the idea is that the, the ratings uh, are comparable program to program, that everybody's being rated in, in much the sim a similar way. Um, and they do talk to clients, line staff, and management staff, and also look at files when they do the review. Thank you, Ginger. We also have another question um, about the uh, the risk levels and, again, the rating that, that we're using in Oregon. Do you find that agencies increase the rates as the risk level increases since time and energy must increase as well? In, uh, I'm sorry, increase the rates of? I believe they're referring uh, financially. Ah, our, um, our funding formula already weights high and medium risk offenders um, much more heavily than low and limited risk offenders. And we do that based on a, um, we did a time study to figure out how much time officers were using at various risk levels of cases. And we load our, our funding includes services and community-based sanctions as well. And those costs are fully loaded on the high and medium risk offenders. So even if a county were to use a treatment program for a lower risk offender, we don't account for that in our funding formula. So we already sort of try and tip the system toward the, uh, where resources go to those high and medium risk offenders. Great. Thank you for those comments. Um, Chris, a question for you in follow-up to your discussion about uh, skill training and making sure that the quality of the implementation is there. Um, they want to know what type of quality assurance initiatives do you think are most effective at evaluating the use of evidence-based practice skills? So what types of quality assurance uh, activities are most effective? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah. I would say that's probably going to be um, uh, direct observation of if you're looking, if you're talking about staff skill rather than trends and who we target and what sorts of services are given, it's going to have to be observation in one way or another. Um, there are a number of different ways that places can go about doing that. You can either audio tape interactions or you can videotape or you can actually sit in directly and observe. Um, I know in, in, in uh, some of the treatment um, programs that are offered through the Correctional Services of Canada, they actually, as a matter of business, audio or I'm sorry, videotape every session that they deliver, and that allows uh, people that are conducting quality assurance just to randomly draw uh, videotapes and link them up with um, with what should have been covered in that session. Which brings up another point or another issue. One of the things that we have to start thinking about is how we structure the skills that we want officers and treatment staff to use. They should be um, fairly structured. There should be steps to them, and they should be observable steps. I think that's important for a number of reasons. You know, aside from it makes it easier to teach uh, staff to use these new skills, it also makes it a lot easier for us to monitor whether or not they're doing it properly. So to me, there would be a couple of things to consider. One is, how are we teaching the skill, and, and what are the steps that we should look for in that new skill or that new practice? And then the second is, well, how do you go about monitoring it? And, and I don't know of any way to monitor it other than through, um, through observation. 
uh, it has to be some observation, either direct observation or audio tape, videotape. Thank you for that, Chris. Faye, we have a question um, that is in reference to some of the organizational issues that you were speaking about earlier. And the question is, can you describe some good communication models between clinical and non-clinical staff for case planning? The um, audience member asking this question is a probation uh, employee, and they're, um, they're experiencing apprehension from their treatment providers in sharing case information. So could you talk to us a little bit about the collaboration that's been discussed? Okay. Uh, well, this is an excellent question, and, um, and, and it goes to the heart of trying to develop these boundaryless or models. So I first want to start out by talking about client consent forms, and particularly the HIPAA form. Um, one of the things that, you know, a lot of organizations um, struggle with is what type of client information can actually be shared. And generally, this is from the health community. But even criminal justice agencies are a little bit apprehensive about sometimes sharing criminal risk information, drug test results, results from you know the LSIR, any risk assessment screens. So I think you know if you really want to have that boundaryless organization, one of the things you uh, might want to do is really review the protocols that both organizations use for um, obtaining consent from the client in terms of sharing information and the type of information that can be shared. And there are some resource manuals from the National um, Association of Drug Court Professionals that have kind of talked about you know, protocols for sharing information. Also, the Legal Action Center, um, which is an, a nonprofit organization, has um, done a lot in terms of talking about kind of what the consent form might want to look like. Now, I know for a lot of criminal justice agencies, they're a little apprehensive about trying to ask the client for consent to share information. But you know, if you go back to this notion that we need to get the person involved in the process, part of that involvement is you know, laying a groundwork in which the client understands that it's in their best interest for information to be shared across these different agencies. And we just need to have the proper protocols in place. Um, so that's one aspect that um, this probation staff might want to look at is the client consent. The next one is this issue about what type of information and what's the frequency of information that can be shared. There are models of management information systems out there, there in which client level data is accessible by um, parties, both parties or multiple parties that are actually working for those clients. Um, and those models exist in places like Utah and Maryland and Hawaii, um, where you know there's just common data set, data information um, that you know multiple agencies can look at. Uh, so that that might be a solution that makes it a little easier if, if everyone shares their case notes and they share some of the diagnostic or performance information on the client. But the third part is is that. At the organizational level, probably the best um, way to address this issue is to have a memorandum of understanding or agreement with the organization in terms of what the parameters of sharing information is. That kind of takes it away from each staff member trying to negotiate with a counselor. Um, it really creates more of a systematic way of doing business where you initiate the relationship by saying, OK, let's agree to what it is we're going to share, who's involved in sharing this information, you know, how's it going to be, um, you know, access information. So, you know, and, it, and if the probation agency is contracting for services, they can put some of this into the contract. But if they're not, if they're referring clients to existing services or they've got, you know, agreed upon slots in another community uh, program, um, they could really you know, the managers of that organization should really be focused on the memorandum of agreement. And that will ease the way um, in terms of trying to really create these boundaryless situations. That was wonderful, Faye. Thank you so much for that uh, detailed feedback. And uh, Maureen, we would like to hear, um, with the contractor data collection system in Connecticut, how have you overcome barriers of um, communication between providers and probation staff? 
Collaboration with the providers has been a really, really important aspect of developing the data system. Um, there's, a, there's a few things that we've done that I think have worked really well for us. One is including them in every step of the development process, um, really making them partners. That's one of those you know, expressions you hear a lot, but they are partners. We want to understand what their business practices are. We want to hear what they think is important. Um, and so when we design the system, it doesn't just meet our needs, but it tries to meet their needs as well. Um, Another thing that I think that we've done that's been really important in collaboration is to, um, to, to really take a strengths-based approach um, and valuing when they're, when they're doing well. And so we've come up with a reward system um, that recognizes providers that have particularly good data. Um, we have a, a level system, and so the ones that are entering data on time and they're entering it accurately, they recognize amongst their peers. There's, there's um, sort of a, a reward system, and I think um, that has helped us build a relationship so that there's um, a respect and an appreciation between, um, between us and them. Um, a third thing that we've done is we've tried to work with them to make our data system valuable to them um, so that it helps them in their daily practice. We've tried to examine what their business practices are and, and find ways to create reports or to show them ways that they can use their data system to manage their operations. And once they've seen the value in this, the data system, um, they're much more likely to be receptive to it and to use it because it, it benefits them in managing their operations. And then the first thing it was what I touched on earlier is that we've, um, we've started to have you know, cross-functional meetings where we get um, the providers in the same room with the criminal justice staff and really try and problem solve and, and align our, our goals um, and try and try and move in the same direction so that we identify what are the barriers and how can we overcome them. Um, and we've really opened up the communication in that respect. Thank you, Maureen, for that practical example of the, the requirement, really, of those true partnerships between the community and the, uh, the state agencies. Now I'm going to ask a few uh, very practical kind of um, client scenarios that we've received from the audience. Uh, the first scenario is about noncompliance and the discussion earlier about um, not removing high-risk clients from treatment for the, the exact reason that you put them in there. Um, the question is, uh, a provider has called a probation uh, officer or supervisor and has uh, explained that a particular client is absent often, has tested positive for alcohol but not substance use, and doesn't for the most part, engage when he is there. Is using a balanced approach that's been discussed by the panel, do you have suggestions on how to handle this kind of uh, an example or, or client scenario? And I'll, I'll let you guys decide who would like to answer that first. I can, I can give an answer yeah, to that. Uh, but, <laughs> Great, yeah. so let's hear from Chris and then Faye. Thank you. Yeah, my, my, there's a couple of things to think about in terms of why people are doing what they're doing. Um, you know, and, and one aspect of it is how does the offender see, you know, what value do they see in participation in, in, that, in that group? And so one of the things, it's difficult because th this question always comes up about six months too far into the supervision process. And so what you have to start doing from the beginning is you have to start picking and choosing which behaviors you're going to reinforce and which behaviors you're going to punish. And when I talk about punish, I'm not necessarily talking about punishment in the sense that we always think about, but simply just disapproval process that you go through with, the, with an offender. And so you're, you're letting them know that what they've done is unacceptable. There might be a, punish for, a punishment for it. There might not. But you're letting them know what they've done is unacceptable, and you're asking them to figure out what are the downsides to continuing to engage in this behavior? So early on, the question should be to this offender, you know, what's the downside for you continuing to fail to, to attend treatment? And likewise, when they go, you should be talking to them and asking them to nominate and come up with reasons that it's good for them to go to treatment. What are the benefits of you continuing to go to treatment? At the end of the day, though, what you have to lay out for the offender is you have to say to them, look, you're in control of what you do. You've got choices here. You can either continue to go to treatment and gain knowledge and work towards abstinence, or if you choose to not go to treatment, there's consequences for that. And here's what those consequences are. You're going to end up going back to court. Again, the decision is yours. You get to choose what you do, but you're also choosing the consequences, too. These are things that you have to set up in the role clarification process when you start supervising somebody that your role as a, as a probation officer is to both assist them in making changes, 
but it's also about administration of the sentence. And it's also about enforcing conditions of the court. And you have to do both. Throughout the entire process, though, the offender gets to choose what they do. We can't control them. We can only respond to what it is that they choose to do. And so you have to, again, you're giving back to them some control over what they do and their behaviors that they engage in. Um, I think you also, again, it has to be a concerted, directed effort to reinforce the behaviors you want to see repeated and to disapprove, at least verbally, of behaviors that you want to extinguish. You might, you might also get to the point to where you start talking about introducing punishments, and there's a whole other uh, set of skills and theory to consider when you start introducing punishment. Behavior that can't continue, behavior that is criminal, has to be responded to. So I, 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 I realize that that might not be the direct answer that they want to hear, but oftentimes um, people pre present these scenarios and, and the problem started six months ago. It's not the situation that they're currently in. So I guess my answer to the question is you have to start supervision differently. That's, that's the answer to that question. So I want to add and take a little bit different lens. I, I agree with Chris. You know, part of this is how you start the supervision process. And, you know, in the supervision plan and treatment plan, talking about attendance and, you know, why the person has um, been asked to go to treatment, if that person has had a prior experience with that treatment program or knows of that treatment program, maybe there's a selection issue that may need to be discussed and put on the table. Um, and I think that's, you know, so really thinking about how we initiate these discussions, how we involve the client in the selection of programs, and then also talking about what the expectations are, are really critically important. However, I think one of the things that we also have to remember is that we have clients of varying backgrounds. So even though we have a moderate to high risk person, it could be that that person has um, low, you know, um, some mental health challenges. It could be that they have some, um, you know, challenges in terms of their cognitive processing. It could be that they have a lifestyle in which they've never really been responsible. Um, and it, and, and the, all of those, those sort of responsivity pieces that we don't talk enough about, um, but are critical in terms of helping people to get up, to show up, is that we need to really think about, so what are some of the barriers that could be from this person attending treatment? Um, it could be, sometimes it's as simple as transportation issues. Um, but I think one of the things that treatment providers have found is that there are techniques that they can use to really help people. Uh, for example, a lot of clients don't really have, you know, calendars like all of us, <laughs> and they don't keep the schedule. So, you know, some of the better um, treatment programs now are really starting to text clients, telling them that treatment starts in two hours. So that gives people, you know, a reminder that today is their treatment day, and it also gives them a time frame to get to the treatment program. Um, some of them have started to do follow-up phone calls to just to see how satisfied they were with the session. Uh, and some of those techniques are designed to really get the client to kind of see that this is for them, but, um, you know, we're, the systems need, are working together to reinforce the importance of them really showing up for treatment. So I think, you know, some of the pointers that Chris talked about in terms of, you know, what the, the responsibilities are of the client, um, can be married with this notion that we have to think about what are some of the issues that the clients present, um, either in terms of their own lifestyle factors or their ability to keep schedules, um, and, and the ways that we could try and improve their attendance of programs. Say thank you for that, uh, and I believe both uh, both what you and Chris discussed there is extremely important, and I think the practical uh, examples and um, even the, the words of advice that you provided in those, those answers uh, will certainly be beneficial to our audience. The last question we have, we will have to keep the, um, the answers fairly brief um, so that Ginger can give us her final thoughts following that. But in California, uh, one audience member writes, treatment programs have been shortened to 90 days while the targeted population was changed to focus on higher risk those folks who often have multiple convictions and other risk factors that previously excluded them from these treatment programs. 
Do you think that the shortened treatment of a hardened, quote unquote, population will work? And if not, or do you have suggestions for this audience member on how to work with the mandates and still help the offenders change? I can provide a brief answer to that. Um, I don't think it's as much time as it is the, the dosage, so I think you need to be paying attention to how many hours of actual direct service they're getting. And the other issue that comes into play here, and this is critical, this is where probation, parole, officers are, are you, you can't underestimate the importance of them in this process because we've now shortened the initial time of primary treatment. The officer then has to be able to pick up on that backside when the offender gets out of that residential program. The officer is going to have to kind of coach the offender then and extend that treatment period in their natural environment, which is a great thing. When you look at the research on cognitive behavioral programming, CBT that's done with parole and probation populations is more effective than it is when it's done with inmates. I think the reason why that's the case is because it's done in their natural environment. So the more that we can extend what they learn in a residential setting into their natural environment or something that comes closer to their natural environment, the better off we're going to be. So I think it can be effective. You have to pay attention to the quality and dosage, and then how are we helping them generalize what they learn in residence, residential setting to their natural environment. So there has to be some nexus between what they learn in group and how it is individualized and applied in their own environment. Um, I, I think also in this scenario, if you have 90 days of intensive treatment, the question is what comes next? Um, one of the things that probation and parole can think about is thinking about a continuum of care, but using multiple different types of programs and services to complement that. So if, you know, for whatever reason the state has limited or, you know, the county has limited to 90 days of treatment, you can think about then, you know, once the person has completed treatment, thinking about adding on maybe education, you know, the person getting their GED or maybe some vocational training. Um, uh, or, you know, some housing support, but other complementary services, particularly if in using the criminogenic need instruments, you identify other areas in which the client has needs that are not necessarily direct related to treatment per se, um, but all those stabilizing factors that affect, you know, how well clients are overall. Um, you can think about trying to couple those together. And so you put together a supervision plan for the client that says, first you're going to do this, direct treatment services, then we're going to go, you know, um, you can select either vocational training, education program, something else that builds on this factor that the person um, has to, you know, do to really stabilize themselves. This way, the probation and parole officer is in a really good position of basically saying, you know, we understand you can't do all of these things at the same time. So over the course of the 15, 18, two years, three years that you're on probation supervision, we're going to, you know, address these criminogenic needs. You're going to address these criminogenic needs, and we're going to take advantage of the multiple services that are in the community. And that builds the person um, up in terms of realizing that, you know, this is a long-term prospect that they're really going to, you know, change their behaviors and get access to the, a variety of services to really help them. 